Juan Flores, California Bandido, by David Smith. Juan Flores isn't as famous as Tiburcio Vasquez or Joaquin Marietta, but in 1856 and 57, he was the most wanted man in Southern California. Flores died at the end of a rope, just like Vasquez. He and his partner, Pancho Daniel, both claimed to have been lieutenants in Marietta's gang. Flores was only 22 years old when he was hung in Los Angeles in 1857. He was born in 1835 in Santa Barbara to a well-respected family of farmers. Flores wasn't happy with this lifestyle and left home at 17 to join a gang of ruthless cattle wrestlers. His new friends consisted of Mexican bandits, American drifters, ex-convicts, fugitives, and army deserters. In his book, Reminiscences of a Ranger, Horace Bell described Flores as a dark-complexioned fellow of medium height, slim, lithe, and graceful, a most beautiful figure in the Fandango or in horseback, and about 22 years old. There was nothing peculiar about Juan except his tiger-like walk, always seeming to be in the very act of springing over his prey, his eyes, neither black, gray, or blue, greatly resembling those of the owl, always moving, watchful and wary, and the most cruel, vindictive-looking eyes that were ever set in a human head. California became a state on September 9, 1850. It was the 31st State of the Union. The Mexican-American War had ended on February 2, 1848, with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. America had wanted California to prevent European powers from getting possession of any part of the Pacific coast. Tension still existed between the Mexican people, the Californios, and the Americans. Some of the California banditos pledged to overthrow the Americans and return California to a Mexican government. Many of the Californios believed this would happen. Some of them helped the bandits when they needed it, to hide from sheriff's posses and for food or care when necessary. They believed the Yankee invaders had driven the bandits to become what they were. Gold was discovered on January 24, 1848 at Sutter's Fort near Sacramento. News traveled around California, bringing people from all over California and Mexico. The following year, after the news reached the east, California was flooded with people from all over the world. There were many small groups of bandits in Southern California. Plenty of folks had been robbed and murdered along El Camino Real, coming up from Sonora and along the route between San Diego and Santa Barbara. The gold rush had brought such a variety of people from all over the world. Not all of them found gold. Many of them were men who had committed crimes in their own countries and had to leave to avoid punishment. Crime was very high from the 1850s to the 1870s throughout California. The gold rush made cattle prices the highest they'd ever been since there was such a demand for meat. The cattle wrestling also was worse than ever. Cattle that used to go for $2 each, mainly for the hide and tallow, now went for $50 and more. There was very little law in California to control all of the 49ers arriving to look for gold. Many of the lawbreakers were handled by miners' law or vigilantes, which led to many, many hangings. Most of the time, questions weren't even asked. Law-abiding miners of Latin origin were also harassed by miners of other races in revenge against the Mexican banditos terrorizing the state. Men of every race who were alone or just a few working their claims were also robbed and many times murdered. The Californios' way of life in the large ranchos was quickly disappearing. The United States ratified the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, choosing to ignore those articles of the treaty promising to honor the ownership of existing Spanish and Mexican land grants. Congress passed the California Land Act, which created a board that would review all land titles from the Spanish and Mexican eras to determine if they were valid. Hearings were held in San Francisco and went on for five years. Rancho owners had to prove to the United States legal standards that they owned their land. Given the system of sketches and informal surveys used in the past, this was sometimes very difficult. These land grants were made when there weren't many people in California. Boundary landmarks, such as trees, rocks, and streams, were used. It worked for the late 1700s and early 1800s, but after the gold rush, with the amount of people who were now in California, these boundary markers were inadequate and didn't hold up in the American courtroom. The U.S. also needed more land to accommodate the American settlers coming west. The three Hardy brothers, Alfred, Garnet, and Calvin, had a freighting and livering business in Southern California. In May of 1855, Juan Flores went to San Quentin Prison for stealing seven of their horses. He was 20 years old. Within a few months of his sentence, Flores and over 100 inmates attempted a prison break but were quickly recaptured and punished.
In October of 1856, Flores got a second chance. Jim Webster, another inmate who called himself the Red Horse, was the leader. He was an outlaw sent to San Quentin from Sacramento. A brig was in the prison wharf being loaded with brick when Jim Webster shouted, Who dare follow the Red Horse? Onward, boys, for the brig and liberty. Juan Flores was the first to follow him. He repeated what Webster had shouted, but in Spanish, and the Spanish-speaking men followed him. Even though the prisoners were all in chains, they were still able to force their way on board the ship. Many of them were shot down by the guards, but 14 of them escaped. The captain and the crew of the brig were forced to go below the deck. The guards aboard the ship were disarmed and thrown overboard. Overlooking the wharf was a promontory which held a 6-pound field piece and a 12-pound howitzer. Both were being fired at the convicts, along with riflemen shooting at them. Red Horse was giving orders to the English-speaking inmates, while Flores did the sp same in Spanish. The sails were set, and they crossed the bay to Contra Costa County and escaped. The men split up and went their separate ways. Law enforcement combed the hills around Santa Barbara, looking for Flores and the others, but the convicts could not be found. Flores had managed to elude the lawmen, making his way to San Luis Obispo. Pancho Daniel was one of the 14 prisoners who escaped with Flores. The two of them started a gang of criminals calling themselves Las Manias, which translates to the handcuffs or the prison shackles. They were also known as the Flores Daniel Gang. The two of them had put together some of the smaller gangs and individual bandits who were terrorizing Southern California into the biggest gang ever. They set up camp in the Santa Ana Mountains and began robbing stagecoaches and pack trains, as well as wrestling cattle and horses. They also ransacked prospectors' camps, kidnapped lone travelers and held them for ransom. Many of the people robbed were also murdered. Bandits were drawn to Flores' charm and criminal vision. Some of the gang members were Anastasio Garcia, Jesus Espinosa, Chino Varelas, Faustino Garcia, Juan Cartabo, and one-eyed Piguinino. They were hiding out near San Luis Obispo in Santiago Canyon in present-day Santana. This was some of the most rugged and remote canyons in the Angeles National Forest. From there, they preyed on the settlers below. The Las Manias gang consisted of 50 to 70 members, but Flores didn't use them all, all of the time. They threatened to go to Los Angeles to overthrow the gringos there. They also met Andres Fontes at San Luis Obispo. He was a native California boy. He had recently served a two-year term at San Quentin in what he said was a trumped-up charge by Sheriff James R. Barton, Los Angeles County Sheriff. Before he'd gone to jail, Andres Fontes had been riding along the road near Los Angeles. He came across Sheriff Barton, who was forcing an Indian woman to go with him. The woman had been living with Barton, but when he mistreated her, she left. She had gone back to her family. Barton tracked her down and was now bringing her back to his home. Fontes butted in and rescued the woman. Barton went away angry. Fontes was probably romantically involved with the woman as well. A few days later, Barton arrested Fontes on a horse stealing charge. He was only about 18 years old. When Fontes was taken from the jail in Los Angeles on his way to San Quentin, he threatened to kill Barton. Even though Fontes had served his time, he joined the Las Manias with Flores and Daniel under the condition they would help him carry out his threat. On January 20th, 1857, Flores and some of the Las Manias attempted to pursue and rob a wagon traveling from Los Angeles to San Juan Capistrano. Somehow they missed the wagon along the road and rode into the town of San Juan Capistrano. Flores and two of his men entered the general store of Polish resident Michael Krasuski. The two men were Antonio Maria Varelas and Juan Cartabo. After casually browsing through the store, Cartabo took a pistol. Then they rode away without paying. Krasuski was angry and rode after them. He knew Varelis and asked him why his friend hadn't paid. Varelis rode back with him to the store, as though as intending to discuss the matter, but abruptly rode off again. Two minutes later, the entire gang thundered into town, pistols in hand, and surrounded the store. Townsfolk scattered. The street was quiet, tense. Everyone waited. Librado Silvas, a customer in the store, bolted the front door, and he and Krasuski held the side door with their hands. A shot rang out, splitting the wood of the door. Grazing Silva's wrist, he spun away in pain. Krasuski's neighbor, Pedro Verdugo, shouted at Varelis, telling him to go away and to leave Krasuski alone. Varelis answered by breaking down Krasuski's door. Krasuski said, I sat down behind the counter with a Spanish basket covering me. I looked upon myself as lost. 
Not finding or ignoring him, the Manias plundered the store, taking what they wanted and hauling the rest into the street. Then they left. Everyone thought they'd gone for good. Those who were reluctant to say anything before talked freely. Krasuski learned that Flores and some of the others had just escaped from San Quentin, where they'd been sent for horse stealing, amongst other crimes. Some of the members of the gang were known to some of the townsfolk, who had tried to hide their identities. Most of the gang members were quite young. Varelas, whose nickname was Chino, was only a teenager. Flores, who was considered co-leader of the gang, along with Pancho Daniel, was only 22. The size of the gang in San Juan was 11. Other sources claim it was between 50 and 100. Some of these men had joined for quasi-political reasons, or they were men seeking vengeance, and some of them had escaped with Flores. Las Manias came back to San Juan Capistrano, entering quietly this time, going first to the home of shoemaker Tomas Barul. Barul's housekeeper was Chola Martina, Flores' sweetheart. The bandidos waited for dusk. When night fell, a gunshot rang through the air, and the body of shopkeeper George Flugart hit the ground. Flores and his men then ransacked the dead man's store, dragging piles of goods into the street. Flugart had two rooms. One was a bar, with the man named Fernando Perez in charge. The other room was a store, which contained an arsenal which the gang needed. Krasuski was dining that night at the home of Juan Forster, who lived at the Mission San Juan Capistrano. A messenger rushed in with the news that George Flugart had been shot and the whole town was in an uproar. Forster decided to go out and try to calm the people down, but his friends persuaded him to keep out of it, because the bandits were stationed all over town. Krasuski stated, He heeded our wishes, and most particularly the supplications of his own wife and several other families that had rushed into his house for protection. Forster's brother Thomas and his friend Miguel Verdugo ventured out to see what was going on. A shot rang out, and they retreated back into the mission. They joined the others who were watching the gang's activities from a safe vantage point. Because the mission faced the town plaza, they had a good view of what was taking place. The bandits, interspersed through town, were not letting anyone in or out. The street was littered with debris, remnants of the plunder of the stores of Henry Charles, George Flugart, and Michael Krasuski. Juan Forster sent a boy on horseback to the sheriff in Los Angeles for help. Among those hiding in the mission were two Americans. One was Garnet Hardy. Two years earlier, seven of Hardy's horses had been stolen by Flores. It was that crime that had sent Flores to prison. Now the bandit was here and in an ugly frame of mind. Forster decided that Hardy and the other Americans should leave. He instructed Brigido, Murillo, an old-timer, to take the two Americans to Los Angeles by way of El Lago Machado, Elsinore. It would be safer. Michael Krasuski said Chola Martina helped set up the murder of Flugart by entering his store and lighting a cigarette to notify Las Manias they could enter. They had murdered George Flugart in his store as he was preparing his evening meal. After placing the victim's body on the table, they sat down and ate the dinner he had prepared for himself. At the same time, members of the gang plundered other stores in town and terrorized the merchants. After looting the town and spending part of the night in drunken revelry, they left around 2 a.m. Before escaping, Krasuski witnessed enigmatic handshakes by the bandidos and overheard them referring to 500 Confederate Mexicans looking in the hills. They were supposedly ready for the start of a massive invasion of the Southland. This situation became known as the Juan Flores Uprising or the Juan Flores Revolution. The boy on horseback delivered the information to Forster's brother-in-law Andres Pico and Sheriff Barton in Los Angeles. While Forster and the nearby ranchos braced themselves for a possible outlaw attack, both Barton and Pico moved into action. Barton and his posse left immediately. Andres Pico began systematically mobilizing California and Ranger forces, as well as sending a rider to Fort Tejon for cavalry support. Barton assembled a posse of five men to go after Flores and Las Manias. His posse included William H. Little and Charles K. Baker, who were constables, Charles F. Daly, a blacksmith, Alfred Hardy was one of the three Hardy brothers, and Frank Alexander. Cyrus Lyon, one of the rangers, warned Barton he didn't have enough men. Barton went and listened and left for San Juan Capistrano. There was no hesitation on his part. He was very dedicated to his job. On the night of January 22, 1857, they left Los Angeles and rode south.